and um, great to see you all tonight. Thanks for coming in the, in the rain for Beers, Books and uh, Brian Brown. So, Brian, um, 80 films and TV shows and then you decided I might have a crack at writing a book. Why did you decide to turn to crime? Yeah, well, I didn't um, decide to have a crack at writing a book uh, at all. It just happened that I, I, I uh, about three years ago, I was watching the TV, I was watching CNN, and uh, the, 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 they, they were talking about these, about six or eight people that had just had a, a, a celebratory um, dinner uh, in Hong Kong around a table. They didn't know each other, but they were having this celebratory dinner. And they'd just all been released from prison. They're all people in my, of my age and whatever, the men and women. And they'd just been released from prison. And the judge had said, you're not drug mules, you're stupid. And these people had all been caught up in scams in certain ways and ended up inside. Um, and I remember looking at that and I thought, if I was one of those blokes, I'd have to know who did it to me. So that was, and, I, and then I thought, that's a bloody good idea, Brian. Um, so I then decided, why not, um, I, think, I think there's a very good um, series in, in a bloke wanting to find out who did this to him and how it happened. Um, and so I set about, um, I, I, I wanted to write it as a pitch. I wanted to pitch it to, to a, a channel or a TV network or whatever. But I thought I better, I better write down what it is that, that this, why this story gets to me, what I, what, why I wanted, to, why I thought it would be good. So I just started writing it, and um, uh, and I went down and talked to the federal police down in Canberra and uh, the cops up in in Sydney, and um, explored, you know, explored how people get caught up in all this sort of stuff. How, you know, and it's people that are that are vulnerable. You know, in many cases they've lost a partner or something, and they're lonely or whatever, and. You know, we all have these scams that come by and, and such, and this, this bloke had ha actually answered one and, and had got caught up. So I started to write this, and then I, 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 I get to a stage and I go, well, that's enough to get a, for a pitch. And I thought, no, 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 I, I think I want to write some more about this character and his relationship and the people that he knows and, or, and Sydney, him going through Sydney to find out, and what I mean by Sydney, you know, out, out to Penrith and all that, to find out uh, what happened to him. So I wrote that and then I kept writing and I kept writing and I ended up with like 13,500 words. And um, a couple of people read it and said, uh, that's, really, uh, that's a really good story. And, um, uh, and I was sort of buoyed by that and I thought, yeah, it's a good story, it, regardless of whether it becomes a pitch for a TV series or not. And, um, and then I started to get a little bit, not really a bug, but I was driving along the car and I'd think about something like, at one stage I was thinking about a mate of mine, Sam Neill, and I thought, what if Sam was a thief? Well, you know, um, uh, Sam's not a thief, um, but the, the, the word Sam the thief kept running around in my head. And so I thought, I think I'll write a story about a bloke, a young bloke called Sam, who's a thief. Why is he a thief? What is he thieving now? What's the story? And so I, I just start to write this character Sam the thief and let him take me on this journey through Campbelltown where, where he lived and what, what was going on. So, so suddenly I had two stories and then I'd always, I'd, uh, my, my sister, she had, um, she had a, 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 a girlfriend who had been, who she'd grown up all her life, she hadn't seen her for a while and she was living in the city and she was found dead one day and uh, in, in her bed and uh, it was you know, she'd overdosed or something like that. And um, I remember thinking, if I was the father, I'd want to know why she got like that. So once again, I started a journey of someone wanting to find out something because they couldn't believe it could just be that they'd, they'd, his, the, the daughter had um, uh, suddenly died. Some, there must be more behind it. So the next minute I had like three stories down there that I was that I totally enjoyed writing, and um, uh, Jennifer Byrne, the book club and many other things, a friend of mine, she read the stories and said, Brian, you know, I really like these stories. I think maybe we should you should think about publishing them. Um, and so she showed them to Richard Walsh, who um, uh, uh, said that he thought the same thing. And the next minute, Alan and Unwin were talking to me about Brian 
what about you, we put a book of these short stories of on, uh, that you write on crime together and I'd, I'd written another one 40 years ago as a pitch for a, for a, for a movie in America uh, on, a, on an Australian couple that go on a journey on a holiday to America and go for a drive and they get caught up in a great darkness um, and I went and looked at that and I went you know it's in the same vein of the stuff that I'm writing now um, and then, so the next minute I had five or six of these stories and um, when Alan and Unwin said, look, let's publish them, I then thought, well, I think I want to write another one to fill this out. And so the next minute um, I had a book. But if someone had said to me three years ago, you're going to have a book coming out, I'd have said, you're joking. Um, there was no way I could have possibly imagined that that was the case. But I have to say, I've enjoyed writing these stories. And I have to say, I enjoy the fact that a lot of people enjoy reading them. I mean, you're, you're yeah, well said. <laughs> I mean, with, um, with, crime, with crime fiction, um, there's often a lot of truth in crime fiction. I mean, you're saying some of the ideas came from real stories that you saw. I think with crime fiction, you can get to that, some of those dark truths and shine light into dark places. Is that, is that something that fascinated you? I think what writing these stories has given me the chance to do is to explore my, my youth, um, I, I grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney out at a place called Panania on the, in the Bankstown municipality. Um, and I, my life was running around in swamps, um, playing cricket in the street, getting sandwiches next door from someone like, you know, that whole community mucking about thing, going to the pictures on a Saturday afternoon, um, climbing up in the picture theatre to, 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 to get pigeons and, you know, to put in your aviary at home, all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, like real outdoor fun young blokes. But a couple of the young blokes got into trouble. And one, one young mate of mine got in, into a particular trouble where he was caught by the cops with, um, uh, with stolen goods. And he went inside for, for, for a little while, for th two or three months. And uh, you know, he told us, he, when he came out, he, he told us just how terrible it was being inside. And, and it, it straightened him out and he, he went on to live a, a good life. But, you know, I, I, I saw many young people, as young blokes like myself growing up, who would make a larrikin step. You know, I, I, and I don't mean everyone, but as far as I'm concerned, everyone's knocked off a Mars bar from the corner shop um, uh, when you're coming home from school. Um, uh, and then the next minute someone goes, you know, there's a lawnmower in that bloke's place there. He's away for the weekend, you know. We could get 20 bucks at the pub for that, and the next is someone does that. And the next minute, they've moved from a larrikin movement into, a, into suddenly doing a criminal act, or a, something that's morally now really questionable. Uh, well, it's not questionable, you know it's wrong. And then do you take another step? And with a number of people, the number of incidents that I've seen through my life, I've gone, I wonder what happened to that man or boy in their life and that set me off in a lot of these cases where I imagined what maybe their lives had become where they'd been led to. Uh, in many cases I will have of course got it very wrong and they've gone, they've gone on to live fabulous decent lives but in many cases I know some of those uh, characters that I bumped into during my early life will have gone on to have li lived very dark and, um, and, and not good lives. Re reading this book, um, I actually could actually to hear your voice. It was like you were telling me the story, the way you speak. Um, so I thought it's probably a little a good time to pause for a minute, just hear you read a little bit from the story. Now we've got a yeah a sense of the characters. Yeah, it's funny when people say that I can hear your voice. I go, what are you talking about? I mean, I have no idea what my voice is. You know, like. Uh, you know, I know what you sound like now. You probably have no idea what you sound like. No, no. Uh, but, but it is a funny thing when people say that. I, I think because people have, you know, been watching you on the screen for so many years, you've, you've a quintessentially Australian voice is what you have. And I think with this book, you've got some really quintessentially Australian crime stories. And, and that's really what I was going to there. Yeah, well, I, I think the other thing is that, you know, what makes it probably very Australian is there's, there's, there's hardly a bloody adjective in them. Um, <laughs> So this is from, um, this is from uh, the first story called Boys Will Be Killers. There were three of them. Two were brothers, Johnny and Jimmy. The third was an older cousin, Phil, by five years. They were eastern suburbs boys, 
could you? It was the mid-70s and even though the Beatles had elbowed the Beach Boys off the charts, the beach was still the place to be. But not for Johnny, Jimmy and Phil. They didn't surf, they thieved. Phil started when he was 15. He'd wander into surf, dive and ski or David Jones, try on a jacket and wander out. No one was onto him and he had a new jacket, which he sometimes offloaded to a schoolmate for a few bucks. Then after a while he got requests, made a fair bit of dough. By the time Johnny and Jimmy were in their teens, they were on Team Phil. That's what Phil called it. Jeans and t-shirts, socks and undies, whatever. Phil knew how to get rid of it and the boys had pocket money, plenty of it. Then they graduated. Break and enters, not much break though. Around the beaches it didn't need to be, no one locked their doors. Knock, knock, hey Tony. If the door was answered they were told, no Tony lives here. Stupid bugger's given us the wrong address, sorry missus. Onto the house a few doors up, same play. Hey Tony, if no one answers, slip round the back and try the back door, usually unlocked. If not, onto another. No breaking down doors, no need. So now it was TVs, radios, jewellery, you name it. Eventually everything sold. Yep. Thanks, Brian. I couldn't help in, in reading these stories that um, it, it feels it was like a, an ode to Sydney. Sydney's a character in this story from, you know, the, the, the southwest, the western suburbs, the beaches. Um, what's Sydney to you? Yeah, well, it's, 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 quite, it's quite, quite interesting. I mean, I, I grew up in the western suburb of Sydney. I lived in the northern beaches when I married. I, I grew up also, when, when I did live in the western suburbs, I used to go to Cronulla to surf. Um, uh, as, I, as I became a young man and, 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 and you know, in my mid-twenties and stuff and mucked around the eastern suburbs, Bondi and all that were, you know, places you had to go to. So I have a, I have a great... Um, a great uh, knowledge of Sydney. Um, you know, I, I knew every back street you could have getting from, you know, banks down to, to, to North Sydney or something like that. Um, and I suppose over the years, I, I've just watched, I've watched Sydney remain the same, but change. You know, those streets are still there. There's freeways and that, but there's still, those still same tr streets are there underneath it and everything. Campsy, which was once upon a time a, a very Anglo place, is now an Asian uh, suburb. And next door, a mile away, Lakemba, is a Middle Eastern. Um, you, I, you know, I go out to Campsie to have lunch and it's nothing like it used to be. It's fantastic. And I watched how Sydney's changed and, and grown into being an incredibly um, colourful and, and multicultural uh, a, a, a city. Um, I, I cannot believe how beautiful Sydney is with the, with the harbour and the beaches going from Cronulla up to Palm Beach. It's just ridiculous that such a place exists. Um, you can take it all for granted, as we all, all do. But, you know, I go out to Manly and I think, are you joking? You can get a ferry to here on one side and you can surf the other side. I mean, how, how does that work for a place that someone can live or, or visit that's not too far away? I mean, I used to, my mum used to take us you know, twice a year to Bondi. My mother was a single parent mother bringing up my sister and I. And she'd take us to Bondi. And, you know, we'd have this great day at Bondi hiring, you know, paying one and sixpence for a for one of those blow up rubber mats that you surf with, you know, it just doesn't get any better than that. And you stand there and a blade spray oil all over you so you get a tan for another couple of <laughs> pence. And, and you just spend all this fantastic time there. And then we get on the tram to go home. And you know, as we're going home, I'd look out the back window and here were a lot of these young blonde boys and girls who didn't have to go home. They lived there. That was their home. And I remember thinking, how do you get to be so lucky to live there, you know, and um, I was always, always, you know, not envious, but I always thought, wow, isn't that great that you can do that? You can live like that. You know? And and look, talking about um, growing up, Panania, um, were you were you a reader as a kid? Is that did you find sort of books that way? No, I hated English. I I, I couldn't stand English at school. I couldn't connect with it. Uh, it made no sense to me. Um, I, I love mathematics and things that I could see and you know, I love sport and I liked all that. But English was just this strange bloody thing. I mean, it had no connection with my life at all. I couldn't engage with it in any single way. Um, you know, Romeo and Juliet, you, you know, Romeo, where art thou? You know, why, why, that, why he didn't just yell, yell out, hey, listen, you want to come down and have a kiss and a cuddle? I couldn't, <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't work it out. Um, and things like great expectations, you know, 
who were these people that lived like this? So, you know, how could I engage with it? Um, but, you know, it was a lack of maturity, I suppose, but also it was also a great love of what was going on in my life, the life of a suburban boy. You know, this didn't touch on that life. And that's why I think it's great for pe that we have people like John Marsden, who writes books that young kids, young Australian kids can read. No one ever wrote a book. I mean, in America was lucky. They had Huckleberry uh, Finn and Tom Sawyer that you could, you could romanticise about if you're a young American kid. But we didn't have anything like that. You know, it was all English stories in big houses and all that stuff. So I couldn't engage with English. You know, poetry was like, what is it, you know? Um, nothing, none of that world made any sense to me at all. So I didn't engage with it at all. It wasn't until I joined an amateur theatre when I was 21 and started to read plays that my world opened, the world of words opened up. And, you know, the ridiculous thing is for the, you know, I couldn't stand English, but for the last 50 years, my whole life's been involved with the English language, either in scripts, books, um, literature, you know, it's just what it's been. Um, and, and, and I didn't buy my first book until I was 25 on, on my way to England uh, uh, to bullshit everyone I was an actor, try and get away with it, and I did, um, uh, that I bought a, bought a book called Bury My Hearted Wounded Knee by Dee Brown, a, a historical sto uh, novel of uh, the, American, the American West. Um, and in the back of a van driving around uh, Europe, I read this book and once again, you know, ideas and thoughts about the world um, uh, became interesting to me. So um, you've just been up on, in Queensland filming a TV series. Um, you had a couple of weeks in lockdown. You got the full pandemic treatment by the Queensland government, as they tend to do. Yeah. Um, what was it like spending a couple of weeks in... Um, in inside four walls with Brian Brown. Um, yes, I had to do um, hotel quarantine in in Brisbane in a in a in a in a hotel there, and and uh, you know I took it as a sociological experiment. You know, like at the end of every day, I'd say, "How you going, Brian?" And, and uh, I go, "Not bad," uh, and, uh, because I knew I knew this was different. I wasn't allowed outside the door, and that's an acceptance that I had to take on. And I wanted to watch myself in taking that on. How would that go? You know, I, had, I made sure I had a pretty structured uh, existence in that, during that day. I had things to do, like I, I was practicing guitar and I, was, I had to do interviews about the book. I had different work that I had to do, you know, answering emails and stuff. And I, I just made sure that I, and I did exercise, made sure that I had a structured routine for it. But the, but the really interesting thing was that I, I looking out at the street, I started to notice people in a way that I'd never noticed them before. Notice how we all walk differently. The way some people will just stop and do something, they'll spend five minutes doing up their shoe or something like that. You know, like I became really quite taken by, and, and, and I don't mean it stupidly, I actually found it quite beautiful how different we all were and how we're allowed to be different. You know, I mean, we're all capable of judging people and going this and that, but like, if you can get rid of that, you just sort of go, God, we're a funny mob, aren't we? You know, and like quite silly, which is great to think. Um, I was looking out one day and I could see this block of flats a bit away, about 100 metres away, and it had an outside stairway. And I was looking there one day at like five o'clock in the afternoon, there was a bloke in a suit just standing out on the stairway. And I was looking at him and I was thinking, what's he doing? He was just standing there for about 10 minutes. I couldn't see his face fully or anything like that, but I could see this man in a suit just standing on the stairway out, out, out behind the building. Anyway, I, I, you know, I watched him for a while and then the next day, about midday, I happened to see two guys standing out there in shorts and t-shirts and I realised they were having a smoke. That's what that bloke had been there. He wasn't allowed to smoke inside. He was standing, I couldn't see the cigarette. He was standing there having a smoke. But like, I was thoroughly intrigued as to what that man do, was doing. And there was a very simple explanation. You know, so those sort of things became really interesting to me in watching people on the, on the street. And when I left um, quarantine and I went to Broadbeach where I was staying, as I'd walk along the beach, I was really, once again, 
focusing on faces and how we behave and all that because suddenly everybody had become new to me. And it took about four days before I just took it all for granted again. <laughs> yeah. I think um, you know, writing can often be about you know, obs observing people. Yeah. Um, so do you, do you in that, in that two-week period, did you do any writing at all in that None. period? None. I'd intended to, and I didn't write a thing. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, what, what's your process, though? Like, what, what's your... So, you, you know, you've sat down and written, I think there's six stories. Seven um, stories. Seven, sorry, um, in there. Um, what, what was your process? I mean, it, you've given us a bit of an insight into that, but I'm just interested in, you know, an early morning riser to start writing or do you just whenever you feel like it? You whenever know, I felt it. like it, yeah. Like, I didn't have... I don't have the discipline of a writer like yourself or other people that their lives have been about writing, journalism or writing. You know, my disciplines are all about the, the game that I'm in, which is film, which demands definite disciplines. Um, and those I'm used to and I, those I adhere to. But writing was very, very different thing. This was sort of like this, this silly fun thing that I was doing. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't taking, I wasn't tr taking it, you know, I wasn't treating it stupidly or whatever. I mean, I was enjoying this process and I wanted to be able to write something that I was enjoying and, or a story that would get me in or get people in. But I w it, it really became characters. Hmm. You know, I'd come up with a character, like as I said, Sam the Thief. And I'd go, okay, well, what happened to... S come on, Sam, tell me a story. So I'd start, to, I'd start to let Sam tell me his story and tell me who he mixed with and tell me where he he made a mistake and where this and where and that would lead me through a labyrinth of of characters and places and that story was set in Campbelltown it's quite interesting a girl got in touch with me and she said I've never read a story set in Campbelltown before she said, I come from Campbelltown it's thrilling you know and I I, I reckon she's right I, I'd find it thrilling if someone wrote a story about Panania let me tell you <laughs> um, you, you you spoke a little bit about people getting conned and the idea and that's the Frank Testy story. Yeah. Um, that, to me, um, it, it was almost like a, a Western. I mean, you, you, you've, you've spoken before around, you know, watching sort of Westerns or... Um, mm. is, is that the kind of... Um, is that what you were thinking about when you, when you wrote that book, an old school kind of, I've been wronged, I'm going to make this right? Yes, I suppose it's, it, I su I suppose it's been the... Um the motivation for a lot of stories, you know, and, and, and you're right, I hadn't thought about that, the westerns that we grew up, you know, going to the, the pictures to see. I think the thing with Frank Testy, uh, who's the character that, I, that I've, I've, I've made as the bloke who wants to find out who did this to him in the scam, how, what happened to him, I think that um, I had to give, I had to, you know, it couldn't be just, you know, he had to have something that enabled him to believe that he could do this, go after, and believe that he was capable of finding out what happened, what was behind it all. So I had to give him something. I had to give him something, some discipline. And so I made it that, that, that Frank was a member of the Icebergs and he swam north to South Bondi every day. Um, and that he'd been a great swimmer in his youth, not enough to make the Olympics, but he became a national coach. So he understood commitment and he understood discipline and patience and so so by able to write about his life as a swimmer i could take that into the story and water becomes quite a part of that story uh, i could take I, I gave him something where you could imagine okay he's he's dealt with hard times and he knows how to hang in and get through them if he's going to try and pull off this thing and i guess that was also you know part of the story of sydney the the surfers the swimming you're, 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 a, you're a surfer, are you? Yeah, I still surf. I surf a longboard, yeah. Yeah? yeah. You've been out today? Uh, no, I went at, the last surf I had was after I came out of Queensland was at Scott's Head there on uh, about last Wednesday. Uh, uh, I had a wave at Scott's Head. I, I thought I'd be rusty, but I actually surf better than I have for years. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what came first before this book. And there's been a lot. We've talked about 80 film and t you know, films and, and TV. So your, your path into acting... So you studied mathematics, you went to work for a bank. I went to work for an insurance company, the AMP. When I left school, and look, I don't know, probably half the people here might say the same thing, maybe 10% of them, but I, I loved school. I, I knew that it was the best lurk I'd ever get in my life. I mean, I had mates, I had three months holiday a year. Um, 
school was pretty easy. You knew what they, you knew, you knew what the teachers wanted. Um, um, so it wasn't wasn't difficult to deliver what was there. But I, I just loved the whole camaraderie of school. You know, I loved being around people and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, most of the teachers were pretty good. A couple of them were pains, but you know, most of them were doing their best to to, to pass on something that'll help you later in life. Um, but I was good at mathematics, and, and, and so. But when I left school, I didn't want to be a, an engineer or anything like that. I didn't want to be anything. I wanted to go back to school, but but I but I had to. And so my mother had heard about this thing called actuaries, which were mathematicians sort of who uh, deal with risk in in insurance companies and all that. And um, but there was only a hundred of them in the country, and uh, it wasn't done at our university. So you had to do it by correspondence from Edinburgh or, or London. So the AMP would give you a scholarship and then you'd study by correspondence. So uh, within the first two days of going into work there, I knew that I was never gonna stay there, but I liked getting a quid in my pocket and being able to buy a beer and, and socialize. So it delivered that to me. Um, but I, I, after about four years, you know, I looked around and I thought, who are those blokes that are always smiling when they came in? And they were the salesmen. And, and I thought, oh, well, I want to be a salesman. So when I was 21, I, I said to the AMP, I, I don't want to be a, uh, I don't want to be an actor anymore. I want to be a salesman. And 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 then I went home and told my mother. And you know, my mother had you know done everything to give me a, an opportunity in life. And um, uh, and I knew she was not, you know, once I'd studied to become an actor, you know, I knew she felt great. You know, okay, he's going to have a decent life. He's going to have a professional life, it's all good. And then I come back and I say, I'm going to be a, you know, I want to be a salesman, to which, you know, the only thing that she knew was a salesman, who was my father, who'd left, who'd left her. So um, she wasn't enamored by me saying I wanted to be a salesman. Um, uh, and so, but just as I became a salesman, the AMP was a big, big, a very big uh, company. And like a lot of companies back then, they had social clubs. They had the, the, the skydiving club or the car club or the snooker club. They also had a drama club. And they used to put on an end of the year review. And so they sent a, 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 a form around to anyone that wanted to come down and, re, and, and audition for this review uh, to come upstairs that afternoon. And so I said to this mate of mine, who was a bit of a lar larrikin, and I said, why don't we go down there? I said, because uh, there's got to be girls down there that we haven't met yet. <laughs> and, you know, that. That's, that's a fair motivation for most blokes at the age of 21, let me tell you. Um, but I got there and then they gave us this piece of paper and they said, okay, in a minute you're going to read opposite someone else. Well, well my mate, you know, was scared. And he went, not, not for me, but I, I liked the idea. And so I read opposite someone and they said, okay, if you want to be in it, come to rehearsal tomorrow. And so at, at, uh, the next day I couldn't wait, wait to get up and go to work because for the first time in my life, I really couldn't wait to get to work because at the end of work was going to be this strange thing called rehearsals. And I did that review and I wanted to know more so I joined an amateur theatre in Sydney. And for the next four years, I, while I was being a salesman, and no one knows what a salesman is doing, you know, I was down the theatre and then on a Friday I'd think, geez, I better get a couple of sales in, keep everyone happy, um, and, which I do. And then I decided at 25, that I had to either, you know, stop mucking around in this amateur theatre and get on with this a career in some way, or have a go at acting. So I told my mother, um, I'm stopping being a salesman. I'm now going to England to be an actor. And you know, the great thing about it was she never said, "Don't be silly, darling," or whatever. She just was like, I could see on her face going, "Holy Christ!" Gave up being an actor. <laughs> He's doing well as a salesman and now he's going to be an actor. He'll be able to work all his life. And so I went off to England and started knocking on doors and telling everybody I wanted to be an actor and, you know, I became one. So, yeah, well said. <laughs> no, there's a lot of people pretty happy about that. Um, so what, what's it like? You, you've been, you know, on the, the other end of the camera for such a long time and then to be the person coming up with the story, um, you know, opening your imagination was that, did you enjoy that? Yeah, and I think that's why I've enjoyed this whole process of putting this book together. You know, like, as an actor, you know, I'll read a script or a story and I'll go, yeah, that story interests me. 
you know, I, I like the theme or I like how it's done or whatever. And then I have to go, okay, now the character they want me to play, how does that serve the piece? Can I deliver something that serves that piece well? And so, um, and, but recently I've realised that really all I've been doing is helping to tell stories. You know, and of course, as an actor, you, you, you know, if you're on a film, you know, you'll get a centre, you'll, you'll, ring, you'll, you'll get in touch, you go, look, I've got a problem with this sort of thing with the character, whatever, and you know, there's a bit of collaboration. And the same with a TV show. You'll, you'll have input, you're playing the character, you'll have input as to where that character can go or, or, you, or, you, or you know, hold on, that's out of step with this character or whatever. And so, you, so you're, the story becomes the real thing that you're dealing with. I, I guess I've realised realize in writing this book that really my life has been about telling stories. And, and, and I have to say that now that doesn't surprise me because as a young bloke in the suburbs, growing up, if you didn't know how to tell a story, you couldn't get out of trouble. You know, you, the, the bully had come at you, you better know how to tell him something that would make him laugh. Um, you got into trouble with your teacher, you'd better be able to throw a line where they let you off. So you learn to tell stories growing up. And I, and I think I've always told stories or bullshit. You know, <laughs> bullshitting is a huge part of life. And that's what telling stories is. And you haven't just told... <laughs> But you, you, haven't, you haven't just told stories, though. I mean, you, you've, you've told Australian stories. Um, I mean, you could have... I mean, you, you did have a Hollywood career, but then in, in, in many ways you, you walked away from that to tell more Australian stories. Um, is, is that what you really want to do, tell Australian stories? I think you've got to understand that when people like myself and Sam Neill, Mel Gibson, Jack Thompson, Judy Davis... Um, uh, when, when, when the, in the 70s and the late 60s, the resurgence of the Australian film industry, when that happened, it was incredibly exciting. The reason I went to England was I used to go to the theatre and I'd see American and English plays and Australian actors putting on American accents or English accents. I remember at the time thinking, well, I'm not going to do that. If that's what happens, I'll go to England and I'll become an Englishman. You know, and then... And so, in actual fact, when I came back on a holiday, when I was you know, 27 or nearly 28, I, David Williamson was writing plays. I went to see a play called How Does Your Garden Grow? It was set, was set in a jail at Nimrod, I saw it. And I knew these characters. I knew these people, how they, I knew the spirit of these men and women. And I wanted to be a part of that. And Peter Weir, Weir was making Picnic at Hanging Sprock, and it was really exciting to think that maybe you could land a movie, which was, which was far more interesting than being in England doing a play. Um, so it was a very exciting thing to find your voice, to be, able to, to be able to be an Australian voice telling Australian stories. It was just bloody exciting. Um, and that excitement never left. And so when I got the opportunity, you know, I did things like break a Morant, that America, the, the studio started to ask me to do things. You know, it, 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 it was because of the Australian stories that I was getting asked to do that. Um, I've got to say, you know, a few times I got hired and then I'd start to do it and, I, and no one ever said to me, put on an American accent. I just started speaking and no one said don't, you know. Um, and, and yet all the characters, like I did a movie with Tom Cruise called Cocktail. The guy was written as an American bartender. I just started talking. No one ever said put on an accent, so I didn't bother. Um, you know, like, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, so I, I, for me, I wasn't having to give up something in doing those movies. But, you know, like you, you, you get married and you have children, you think, where do you want them to grow up? And I knew that I really wanted to tell more stories about this joint. You know, I'd been brought up by a really strong, generous woman. Um, you know, that type of person I understood. I knew what it was to be a young Australian bloke growing up. You know, I know what, it's, what it is to be, you know, I know what, what, what our struggles are in this country. I know what, what, our, what our, you know, like, I know the, 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 the silliness that, are, that Australian men are, you know, like, I understand all that, go, and, and we're different to other people, and I go, well, we have every right to have that voice out there, 
and 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 so you know it was I wanted the kids to grow up here um, and um, so it just became all right um, that's going to mean being asked less to do things but I, I still got asked to do loads of bloody things and went off all over the world doing stuff and and um, you know and and, and 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 but I got the opportunity to do things you know you know I did a movie called um, Two Ants where I got to play this 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 Pando. this this crim called Pando like and and you know like I'd hate to have never played that character you know like I would have gone you mean to say I didn't play Pando that would have been such a bloody missing out on something you know like so all those sort of things come into the kaleidoscope of of work and and all that stuff you know that I do so what do you think so as someone who's been telling Australian stories for so long what what do you think of Australia now the story I guess of Australia and the, the identity of Australia at the moment? Well, I don't, uh, you know, like, I, I'd rather go global on that. I, I, I'm, I'm finding a great disappointment in the world at the moment in that we're, 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 we're being terribly devise, d divisive. You know, everyone's got to be in that camp or that camp or that, and we're just losing the fact that we're all bloody human. You know, like, we feel, I mean, this pandemic... You know, like, when I went up to, um, when I was in Queensland, I struggled with anxiety. I got, I really had three or four very, very difficult periods, right? And it was to do with a number of things. That, that, but a lot of it was to do also with the fact that the difficulty I was having, I couldn't go home and talk it out, or I couldn't talk it out with my kids, or I couldn't talk it out with my wife, or I couldn't just, you know, grab someone that was close to me and, and just hug them and go, oh, it's all right, it's fucking all right. Um, this sort of stuff was going on. I was having to deal with this. And, you know, when I, before I went up there, I'd, I'd hear about people who, whose loved ones were overseas maybe dying and they couldn't get to them. And I'd go, I was very sympathetic to it, as we all would be, I'd say, it's terrible. But only in having been up there and actually gone through something where I couldn't get out and I couldn't get a certain help that I need, am I really able to empathise now with it and realise what some people have gone through. Um, and, and that's, you know, really terrible for what we're all having to deal with with, with, with this pandemic. Um, but, you know, I, 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 and, I, and I think that's helped us all to understand that we're really all human and, and you know, we, we all experience exactly the same things at different times, at different levels. So we really are the same, but we're getting so divisive about and judgmental on each other. I'm in this camp, I'm in that camp, I'm in that camp, I'm in that camp, I'm, in, I'm morally right here and you're morally wrong there. Uh, that stuff is just completely and utterly shitting me off. Yeah. yeah. We're going to have plenty of time for some questions, so and we'll get to some pretty soon. Um, but just staying on that for a moment, I mean, you're an incredibly, you know, proud Australian as, as, as I am too. And do you do you think that we've well, like, we've lost the ability to listen to each other? Is that what you're saying? Well, I I, I I guess that I guess it comes down to that. We're we're too interested in what. What, what we think is right, or what camp we want to belong to, rather than just listening to someone who, who has a different take on something. You know, we got to go, they're wrong, or, or we're wrong, or something. Yeah, like, look, I'll always, you know, like, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm incredibly glad I'm an Australian man. Incredibly glad. You know, it, you know, I've been gifted a certain bloody Australian sense of humour. You know, like, I like the fact that we can be silly. I like the fact that we, we can also be incredibly charming bastards. I mean, we can go to parties overseas and pull the girls. There's no question. There's no question, you know. Um, um, but, 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 you know, like, I, I like the struggles that have shaped us. They're our struggles as men and women. The, you know, the, the colonising of the place, the, 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 the struggle of therefore taking someone else's lands and what, what it's meant to those people. You know, that struggle's going to go on for another 
you know, it's going to go on forever to try and work out how, what, how we make things right for, ev for everybody or how we, we, we make something like that. Work. But every country has to deal with these sort of things. We've got struggles to deal with. Um, life's not worth living without struggles because if you don't have the struggles, you can't have the joys. You know, and in Australia, we get many, many joys. But we, you know, um, we, we, you know, if the struggles there, we've got to deal with it. And um, uh, and I think probably in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, we've we've taken on some of those struggles, and and some of them have been very hard for people to to accept. But you know, the, the you know, we uh, that's our job. You're you're talking like a, a writer who's got a bit more to say. Do you, are you going to write another book? You know, I've been asked that, you know, like, and, um, you know, I, I, um, uh, I'd certainly like, I'd certainly like to have a story out there that's bigger than the short stories I've done, right? I'd like to have a story out there. And I've got a sort of thing that's, that's mucking around in my head, but I actually think it's really difficult and I'm not dead sure I'm capable of doing it. So I'm going to fiddle a bit. Well, I think you're capable of it. I mean, I really enjoyed the book. And, um, and I hope you do. I hope you do write another story. Thanks, um, if Jim. there's any questions, just maybe stick up your hand, and I'll try to get to you. Um, Dan's actually going to come and grab my microphone. I think I've got one down there already. Nice. What makes Jimmy sweet? What makes Why what? sweet Jimmy? What makes Jimmy sweet? Um, because he was called that by a girl that loved him. She called him Sweet Jimmy. Hi Brian. Um, I think it was the early question, the first question about your book and it's, and it's a crime book. It's filled as a crime book. I haven't yet read it, but I will. Um, and I think you were saying that you were interested in why people commit crime. Um, so in that respect, I understand it's a crime book about this problem. And I believe that this is a major problem in our community about why people commit crime. And there are very simple answers to it, as you probably know. And you have such an amazing voice to get to the community about this. And I'm wondering if you, in thinking about what you might do next in terms of writing, might be thinking about lending your voice to this really serious community problem that we have now. Well, look, you know, like, I hope that in the book, in the stories that I've written, even what the boys do, there's an understanding of what the boys could have been mm. with another opportunity or with a, with a help or a support, that you don't make a... If you're looked after when you're young, you've got a very good chance of having a good life. If you're not looked after when you're young, you've got to struggle. Many have wonderful spirit and get that struggle and have a wonderful life. But others, others hit walls and the people that help them are the people that are no good for them. So, you know, it comes down to parenting, doesn't it? In the end, it comes down to parenting. Right. <laughs> I know we're here to talk about the book, but um, with 80 movies and TV productions, I'm wondering, what's your favourite character you played? Favourite character? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good question because, you know, like, I've liked them all. Um, you know, like, and there's obvious ones like Pando is fun and all that sort of stuff. And I, I really liked a bloke called Joe Harmon in a town like Alice so much that I called my son Joe. 
I think it's such a great bloody man's name. I really, really like the name Joe. Um, uh, uh, I did a film recently called Sweet Country, which was, uh, which was um, uh, an indigenous story, quite a hard story uh, by an indigenous writer-director called um, Warwick Thornton, who uh, is a pretty fan fabulous bloke. Um, and I played this, uh, this cop back in the, in, in, in the, in the 1800s uh, who goes tracking a, 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 an indigenous bloke. Um, and I really liked playing that character. I really liked playing the fact that this guy had a job to do, but in doing the job, he started to learn more about he started to realise that there was more than just black and white in life. Um, but in dealing with the law, he had always had to deal with black and white. Uh, I, I enjoyed playing that sort of character. Yeah. Fletcher was his name. I like that name too, Fletcher. <laughs> No, I'm not going to talk about those other things. Because <laughs> I don't intend to have a whole lot of trolls come at me. Um, the things that delight me, Sydney Harbour and the ferries. I think the ferries are about the most wonderful thing that we have that we don't use enough. And in Balmain, for God's sake, you know, it's like they're our own transport. <laughs> But getting on a ferry, any ferry to be on Sydney Harbour, you just get taken for whatever number of moments it is on an entertainment ride that's better than what you're gonna do when you get off, you know. I also delight in, you know, the little, um, like I like going to Cockatoo Island and getting off for an hour and buying a soup in the winter and sitting there and just staring out and having a soup and getting on the ferry and going home. So, you know, like, um, uh, there's, a, there's an enormous number of simple pleasures uh, that Sydney has to offer. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I delight in all of those. Um, I also delight in, in the fact of, you know, when I do get a good wave and I'm, you know, at 74 surfing like a 73 year old, I feel really good. <laughs> We're down here. Down here. I'm also with you on the ferries. Ferries are great. Um, I was just wondering, you obviously have worked in film and TV where the story begins on the page. Was writing yourself and visualising it a really different experience from reading someone else's words? Like you're visualising it in your brain knowing it's going to end up on a written page instead of on a screen? Yeah, I do find it strange when I, when I am asked to read something out of sweet Jimmy or when I had to lay down the I did the the narration for it on the, the, the you know the audio book and whatever they said to me um, well you're going to have to do the narration I said well I've never done that before I don't know how to do that and and they said well it doesn't matter you've got to do it you know it's got to be your voice <laughs> um, and and, and, and I, I had to say that as I was reading it there was a couple of times I thought geez this is pretty good <laughs> um, um, and, and, and let me tell you Still, it's strange to me because my game is other people's words. That's been my game for 40 years, other people's words. So it is strange to me that when I look there and I see a book and it's got my name on it and they're actually stories and it's written and, you know, yes, there's not a lot of adjectives, but it can still be a story. Um, you know, I, 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 it's strange, but it's, 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 it's becoming sort of delightful without making me run, run off with it. You know, it's not a massive career change or something, but, but I, 
I do enjoy, I enjoy the fact that maybe I can put a story together on the page. Yeah. Ah. Um, I believe you live locally, don't you? Live locally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my question's got two parts. What, what drew you to Balmain having kind of lived all over Sydney or, or experienced a lot of Sydney? And second part, what's the best boozer in Balmain in your opinion? <laughs> Yeah, a couple of good questions. Um, you know, the great thing about Balmain is it's a village. You know, most of the, you know, like I can't believe, you know, I can't believe when I drive up the Pacific <laughs> Highway or something like that, you know, all these, all, all, you know, once upon a time you'd, you'd drive up um, Parramatta Road and shops would be open and restaurants, I used to go to restaurants on, you know, up there in Leichhardt on Parramatta Road, you know, when I was 30 or something like that, it was all alive and they're all dead now. And, then Pacific Highway, you know, places like Taramara Pimble, you drive through them, the street, the, you know, they're nothing. I mean, you go through uh, Balmain, it's a village, it's just people sitting around having coffee, buying stuff, walk, you know, you can actually walk across a pedestrian crossing in Balmain, the cars know they have to stop. <laughs> it's bloody unbelievable. They don't bip and say, get out of the road or whatever, they go, oh, I've got to stop. The bus drivers stop, the garbage men stop, everyone bloody stops. It's, it's, it's pretty fantastic. Um, and I think the other thing is, you know, like, you get to say hello to a lot of people, you know. I know the name of the ladies, you know, in the ANZ bank, I know, you know, the blokes of Batonis, I know, you know, the, the, the other coffee shops, I know the, the butchers, uh, you know, you get to go, g'day, how you going? Like, um, uh, and, 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 and interestingly, those things are terribly important, I realise, after what, what, what the, the, the quarantine thing did what, uh, on, on, you know, normalcy, the things that we take for granted, the little things that are part of our life, when they were taken away, you know, they don't seem like a big thing, but they are actually your life. And, uh, and I, like, uh, I like the life in Balmain. Yeah. As for which is the best boozer, I gave up drinking uh, in, in pubs um, a, a while ago because, uh, you know, uh, too many people, you know, would, you know, either I'd get a drunk telling me you, you think you can act, do you? Or, um, you know, or, 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 you know, people wanting photos. I could never get through a beer. So, you know, like I, I, um, I don't spend a lot of time in, in, in the pubs anymore. You know, I used to go for a drink at the William Wallace, but that's sort of closed down now. You know. Hi Brian. So Sydney Theatre Company said they wanted to adapt your stories. Would you adapt them and would you sign them? Yeah, I'm looking forward to someone coming up and saying they want to option mine instead of me going to other people and saying I want to option theirs. <laughs> yeah, but I'll be a really tough negotiator, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, Brian, yeah. just over here. The, uh, obviously in your acting life, you, you knew that people were playing opposite you. Tom Cruise, who could forget Elizabeth Shue coming out of the water at Cop Car. Um, but now that you're, you're crime writing, uh, obviously you're learning colleague next year, um, the right crime as well. Who do, you, who do you look up to in crime writing or had you discovered that before you became a crime writer yourself? Yeah, no, I read a lot of crime. Um, I, I, I love the genre. And, and, um, uh, and, and for example, the, the thing I like about the great crime writers is they'll take me to a place. And it's like Rebus, is, uh, Ian Rankin's Rebus. You know, you really feel after you've read a couple of his books that you know Edinburgh. You can smell Edinburgh. You know, and Hanning Mankell's Wallander series. You know, you feel like you know the bleakness of Malmo. I just think, I think that's one of the great things about the great crime writers is that is they deliver a place to you. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's, that, that's something that I really love in, 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 um, in, in, you know, I like that aspect being there with the mystery or the crime. Um, and I think that's one of the things I enjoyed about this being able to write, you know, about Campbelltown or Petersham or you know, or Epping or bloody um, Bondi or, you know, to actually write about this, this city that I've lived in and experienced and, and try and bring the, that smell of what those places are to the stories. You know, that's, that, that's, that, it's actually great sitting down thinking, I'm going to set this in Campbelltown. It's really great thinking that. You know, it might not seem like it, but it is to me. I said, 
bloody camel tail. I'm going to set a story there. Uh, over here. Yeah, about research on this book, how did I know about crime and stuff like that. Well, it was funny, I was, this show that I was doing up in Queensland just recently, um, the bloke that was my stand-in was an ex-cop. He'd been a cop for 37 years. Lovely fella. Um, and he, he read it and then he, he got a lot of other cops to read it. And the, the other cop said to him, Brian's got to have the inside from someone. <laughs> you know, and quite truthfully, um, the only where I where I researched was the thing about the scams. I went, I did go and research. I went to Canberra and talked to the federal federal police and the state police here. But otherwise, you know, like no, uh, like uh, you know, you, 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 uh, my I, I, I let my imagination be the be the you know that's the fun of a story is your imagination at work. You know, so in many cases, look, you know. I, I know a bit about crime, you know, let's get it right, you know, like, I've killed so many people, <laughs> you know, you don't just get to kiss girls in movies, you get to kill people, or get killed, so, you know, I don't have to research too much, you know, like, I, I know a bit about crime. We have time for just one more question, was there any more questions from the floor? Well, thanks everybody, oh, no, there's just one more. Well, I really enjoyed tonight, thank you, and um, we're excited to come and see you and also to uh, support our good mate Tim. He's just written his third book. What advice would you give him uh, <laughs> for his writing moving forward, but also how he can crack it in the, in the film industry and the TV industry moving forward, and could you help him along the way? Thank you. <laughs> That, that, that can only be a mate, right? That yeah. can only, only be a mate. You know, a bloke that's written seven short stories now going to tell a bloke who's written three books, you know, what he should do right. You know, and has just signed a deal, an option to, you know, on his books. Um, you know, like, uh, I know you probably think he's a deal, but I think he's going all right. <laughs> Yeah, anything over 50 I can play. <laughs> Thanks everyone for just a wonderful round of questions. Can I ask you all to please give a big thank you for Tim and Brian. Thank you. Thank you.